There are physical exam issues, of course, uh, lymphodynia. This is in especially phase one, of course. Tenderness in the posterior cervical chain, crimson crescent fever. <coughs> There's subcortical brain injury as assessed by hyperreflexivity and the normal in the lower extremities, especially the ankles and knees, and with respect to balance. I, I did notice um, that as my cardiomyopathy got worse and worse and worse, my balance got worse and worse and worse. And when my, I got restored, my balance got better and better and better. So a lot of these things do go away. The metabolic disturbances keeps getting longer and longer. Um, they're short in breath holding, but a little over half the patients cannot hold their breath for very long without difficulty. They don't transport. If you put a pulse oximeter on the finger and you have them hold their breath for as long as they can, over half of them will fail to desaturate normally. In fact, half of them just about don't desaturate at all, which I've tried to tell people that that a pulse oximeter only measures oxygen in the blood. It doesn't measure whether it gets into the cell or not. And when you hold your breath, that forces a physiological stressor to cause the hemoglobin to lose the oxygen into the cell because you're not breathing. And if you have a disordered microcirculation or failure of transport mechanisms, then no matter how long you hold your breath, you don't desaturate. I have a guy which I'll show you, held his breath for 80 seconds, didn't desaturate, which is phenomenal. Fingerprint destruction. And <coughs> we be our best guess at the destruction of the fingerprint uh, due to biopsies we've done and the dermopathologic dermo reading is that disorders, there's a disorder of, um, of fibroblast function which fails to lay down enough collagen to keep the fingerprint intact. We also suspect there's some significant oxidative stress involved. Those are the two pathologic findings for this. Subnormal temperature. You start out with a fever, but you end up with a low temperature. So much so that people have suggested to you that your problem is hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. And I would guesstimate, just guessing, that a significant proportion of you are on thyroid medicines. Right? Well, <clears throat> one of the th or things early on that happens when you lose cardiac output is you, you can no one of the things you sacrifice first besides your gut is you sacrifice your skin. So you no longer, <clears throat> you no longer have enough blood supply to, to offload your heat. If, if, if you need to, just as an example, if you're sitting there in your chair, the normal output given to the skin is half a liter a minute. If you go out into that temperature out there, which is approaching 100 degrees, do you have any idea how much output is then thrown into the skin to, to get cool at 100 degrees? Do you have any idea how much output is apportioned to the skin? It goes to three liters a minute. Oh my goodness. Do you know what the average cardiac output of a CFIS patient is? It's position dependent, but the average is about four liters a minute. And you're going to put three quarters of it into your skin, leaving one liter per minute for the rest of you? That isn't what your body does. If it did that, you won't be around long. Your body doesn't give your skin three liters a minute. Therefore, you cannot get rid of your heat. So what's the next best thing to do? Turn your thermostat down. And what, pray tell, is that? It's called thyroid hormone. So you down-regulate your thyroid hormone production to save your life. And it'll look different than ordinary hypothyroidism. Typically, the hormone levels will actually be fairly normal, but you'll seem hypothyroid. Because what's actually happening is you down-regulate the thyroid receptor. <coughs> and the thyroid that you are making often just pours out in the urine. You can measure it. It'll be high. So it is, there's a lot of things that, um, that really make you wonder about what exactly are we treating? Are we treating the symptom repercussions of compensatory mechanisms, or are we treating the underlying disease? And what, pray tell, happens when you give thyroid excessively to people in heart failure? They get even more heart failure. 
because it decouples oxidative phosphorylation and can degrade energy production. Uh, low blood pressure is very common. That's a clue, by the way. You can actually, I call it brute force calculation of your cardiac output. Brute force determined the, the millimeter of mercury difference between systolic and diastolic pressure. It's called the pulse pressure. Multiply by two, then multiply by heart rate. That is your cardiac output. It's a brute force method. It's in the textbook of physiology. Twice the pulse difference between systolic and diastolic pressure. So if your pulse rate uh, if your blood pressure is 90 over 60, which is not at all uncommon in this disease, that's 30, that's a difference of 30, times 2 is 60, that's your stroke volume, 60 cc's. Normal stroke volume, 115 cc's. That means you're operating at a 50% reduced level of cardiac output right there. But cardiologists will think, well, you know, that's anything, your left ventricle is working great, which in fact it is. So they don't, they don't get it. Hypertension is very rare. As a matter of fact, I've often thought that hypertension almost excludes this diagnosis. I've long thought that. The only people that are ever hypertensive with this disease often had a family history, of, a strong family history of hypertension, and, after, and they had hypertension before the disease, and when they get the disease, the hypertension is much less, and they're coming off of their medications. There are some exceptions, though. If your adrenergic tone is excessive in response to your output, you can get moderately hypertensive. <coughs> now, um, this is uh, basically a model of what, um, I guess, as I said, the basis of this disease, I believe, is a, is a dysfunction, metabolic dysfunction, really at the mitochondrial level. Can you break? Well, this is, this is actually a pretty good place to break. So we'll, we'll call, I don't know, did you, oh, 10 minutes, yeah, 10 minutes. Now, the, uh, <coughs> this is a model that we have uh, accumulated over the years. I've adjusted it slightly <coughs> for the new idea of cardio, cardiac dysfunction, diastolic variety. And at the center of this is um, a cellular metabolic dysfunction that is actually what it is, primarily is an energy problem at the cell level. Lack of sufficient mitochondrial en energy production is the, is the center of gravity of this disease. And to me, it makes absolutely good sense that anything that you would label fatigue has to, at some level, involve energy production. So why not? I mean, why is that such a difficult thing to grasp? But is it a difficult thing to prove? No, not a difficult thing to, to grasp. Uh, in the initial phase of this disease, there's significant immune activation, which involves activation of the 2,5-A RNA cell pathway, which has been much published by uh, Soldolnik and others, and was the basis of the pharmaceutical drug trial for Amplogen, which regulates this antiviral pathway. RNA cell is, a <coughs> is, is significantly activated in the early stages of this disease. In Lake Tahoe, for example, when we measured RNA cell activity, it, it, this is an enzyme that's, uh, that's upregulated and defends you against intracellular organisms, such as viruses. And as the enzyme upregulate, <coughs> it actually chops in half the messenger RNA that's for which the virus is coding for its proteins and it is it's just replicating. So it's interfering with the ability of the virus to replicate. So RNA cell is intrinsically a defense mechanism against an intracellular pathogen. However, when it's dysregulated and other uh, complicated things that have to do with its regulation, it can mistake viral messenger RNA for human messenger RNA and begins to chop human messenger RNA and can grade, dis, degrade significantly uh, cellular energy production. Indeed, the, have you ever heard of mononucleosis? Right. Well, the, the fatigue of mono is classic. It's a classically described fatigue. And of course, very early on, this disease was known as chronic mono and was linked to the known agent that causes mono, Epstein-Barr virus, very early on in the history. Well, <coughs> guess what causes mono? At least, guess what causes the fatigue of mono? The answer is RNA cell. That is what's causing fatigue. Because it, in, in your attempt to defeat the virus, you upregulate an enzymatic pathway which degrades your energy production. That is your fatigue. It's not the virus doing that. It's you that are doing that. 
You do it through RNA cell. <clears throat> so in the beginning, the energy loss probably from an acute viral infection, and what's the difference between an acute viral infection and the viral infections that you can, uh, can get with EBV, CMV, HSV6, et cetera, the human herpes viruses, is you know the answer to that is you don't really ever have an acute and only acute infection. These things stay in you for the rest of your life and just oscillate between active phases and, and, and uh, quiescent phases, so-called inactive and active, and inactive and you just oscillate the rest of your life. We know this because sampling of the saliva of teenagers in a classroom or in college, what percentage of, this, of, the, of a class of West Point cadets in excellent health and feeling fine, <coughs> what percent of them have active EBV in their saliva? Uh, 